when considering our Lord's death, brethren, there's a number of things I want to consider and highlight, some expressions in Scripture. The thought I'll be sharing with you concerning the Lord's death is Him, sin being condemned in the flesh, and being made to be sin, and made a curse on our behalf. Christ did remove the sins of the world, but before sin could be removed, it first had to be judged. That's something we need to know. That's going to be the main thought of my meditation. Now, there are three passages here I want to, each has a certain thing I want to highlight. And these are passages that I commonly find together when speaking on the subject. The very first one's going to be Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. This text reads, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and of for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. That last part's what I want to highlight there. Condemn sin in the flesh. The next one's going to be in 2 Corinthians, and it's going to be in chapter 5. Verse 21, last verse of that chapter. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. The thing you want to highlight there, made to be sin. And then the last one, the third one here, is going to be in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And the one you want to highlight there is, being made a curse. Those three things I want to highlight. But before I deal with those three things directly, I want to expound some on the righteousness of God in this matter. Now God has described himself as righteous in the scriptures. I'm going to read to you some of the Psalms here, how they speak on this. Psalms 11 verse 7 says, For the, Lord, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth uphold the upright. Another reference here in chapter 116, verse 5, it says, Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. Amen. One final here in Psalm 145, verse 17, where it reads, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all of his works. I mean, this is the, this is the message in the scriptures. God is holy, God is righteous. He's righteous in what he does. His judgments are righteous. His nature is righteous. So if he is in fact righteous and he loves what is righteous, as the scripture, he loves righteousness, then the logical conclusion is that he hates sin, he has no tolerance for it. That's just, that's just, that's what you're going to end up with. Also in the Psalms, it says God's angry with the wicked every day. That's Psalm 711. It says he hates all workers of iniquity. He's against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance from the face of the earth. And also, he's gone on record even saying this. This is Psalm 119, 155. It says, salvation is far from the wicked. That's what he said. So there's no question that God has no tolerance for sin. That's not even a question. Or that he abhors it greatly. His righteousness cannot leave sin unnoticed or unpunished. Now, on another note, God is a merciful God. And he would rather save than destroy but he will not deny himself or contradict his nature in order to save men. That's not going to happen. If there's a way for God to save men without going against his righteous nature, he's going to do that. That's what he will do. However, if saving men requires him to go against his righteous nature, he's not going to do it. If, that, it, it, when it, if it comes right down to damning men or just leaving sin unnoticed, he's going to resort to judgment. That's what his righteous nature demands. Justice and righteousness. He can't ignore these things. However, there was a way for God to save man without denying himself. We give thanks for that. Amen. But judgment was required in that thing still. That's the thing. He didn't, he didn't have to just throw judgment out the door, just ignore that. There, was, there did have to be judgment. But the judgment was placed on someone else, which was the only way the sins could be removed. Before one sin could be removed, all sin had to be judged as a whole. The solution of sin couldn't be smaller than the, than the circumference of the guilt of sin. The sin couldn't fall short of where, how far the transgression had gone. It had to cover all of it. So God, in a righteous act, takes all sin and places it on His Son, making Him pay the penalty in your stead. Now I'm going to deal with these three phrases I asked you to highlight directly, starting with this one in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Condemn sin in the flesh. This emphasizes the punishment for the sin. 
In Scripture, we have seen how God's punished men for their transgressions, for doing wicked things. He drowned them in the flood. He rained fire and brimstone on their cities, struck them with worms, destroyed them with plagues. Now, seeing that God has given such judgments to men who are guilty of their own trespasses, it seems almost impossible to comprehend or imagine the severity and intensity that one would face when punished for, all, for the sins of all. Yeah. Go ahead and observe in the scriptures just ju the kind of judgments one sin brought. I mean, I, just off the top of my head, you may think David's, David's sin with Bathsheba. That one thing he did, look what it did. All persecuting the church, look what it did. I mean, just just to give just a few references there, that's just, you, you got to gamble if there's one sin. One thing can, like, completely change a person's life. But after doing that, try and consider the judgment for all sins ever committed. Not just in one generation, in the whole history of the world. Christ suffered for all sin, therefore his suffering and death surpasses that of all other punishments. The fact is, there is no freedom from sin unless it's first punished. Jesus paid, was punished for your sin, so now you have that, uh, you can now be set free. Next one says, made to be sin for us. This is the one from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is a most unique expression in scripture that is to be spoken of with great caution and handled with care, lest we give a loose view of the text. All sin had to be localized in one place before God could punish it. You notice Christ in, I think it's John chapter 1, he says he's a Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in that text, sin is in the singular. Once all sin was placed on Christ, it could be dealt with like as one sin with one single heavy blow, so to speak. The fact is, God made Christ something that he wasn't by nature. The following part of this the following part of this particular verse clearly states he knew no sin. So this wasn't something Jesus was by nature. Right. It was not natural for him to have sin in him. He had no part of him that was weak. There was never a time he had a foolish thought or committed a transgression. So he never became a sinner like, you know, Adam. He was at one time blameless for a while. And then when he committed aggression, he then became a sinner. This isn't the case in Christ. He was a perfect lamb without blemish and without spot. He wasn't a sinner by nature. Like David said, I was born into this body of sin. Was like, this isn't the case with Christ. He was, not, he was not out to the lineage of Adam. Now in this sense, he was made to be sin. That's the thing. He was made sin. In the sense that his identity was temporarily changed due to the placement of sin on him. Lastly, this one in Galatians says he was made to be a curse. Now curse, that's a very strong word. Now, dealing with that within a general, just in a general sense when you, people use that word, think like someone cursing another person. In that sense, cursing means to injure, to subject to evil, to vex, harass, or torment with great calamities. It also involves calling for injury or mischief to fall on someone, in a use, and usually it's for wrongdoing. When someone commits an offense, that person is targeted, and then it brings, like, in the aspect of punishment, bringing some kind of suffering on that person. This also shows the magnitude of Christ's sufferings. He was condemned in the flesh, as Romans, as Paul affirmed in Romans, but this adds to the expression. Cursing, also you'll notice, also involves like excommunication or being forsaken. In some situation, if a person is cursed, then no one's allowed to be around that person. They're thrust out in uninhabited places where no one is around. Kind of like the scapegoat. The sin was put on him, get it away from you, and put in a place where there's no one at. That's like an, that's an example of cursed. It's not, it's not allowed to be around. And even in the sex in uh, Deuteronomy 21-23, curses everyone that hangs on a tree. That's, that's presented there too. You don't, don't leave them on that, don't leave them hanging on that tree all night long. You take them down, you bury them that day because anyone who hangs on the tree is a curse of God. Take it down, bury it. Get it away from, get it away from, your, from your presence. Mm -hmm. Amen. So Christ was cursed in that sense by both God and man. Man rejected him. And due to their sin being laid on him, the Lord God himself forsook him on the cross as well. God did not hesitate to bring judgment on our Savior when the world, sin of the world was placed on him. He also did not hesitate to withdraw from him either. Because God will not tolerate sin in any way or any form. Not even if it's found in his son. <coughs> Which wasn't his sin. I will clarify that. It was not Jesus was guilty of something that he did. It was your sin. And then God couldn't even tolerate your sin in someone else to make sure I don't garble that up. But even though these facts are hard to consider, we must not forget that it did please the Lord to bruise him. 
God certainly had a determined outcome in all of this, and he got exactly what he wanted, didn't he? Because sin was punished, men could have remission of sins. <coughs> because sin was dealt with, men could go free. Because Christ suffered the penalty, God is right in saving us. Now, God shows himself to be righteous in what he did with his son. That's the thing. He, like we went over earlier here, he says he's a righteous God, and he shows that here in the way he dealt with the human race in Christ Jesus. He showed himself. He lives up to that name. I am a righteous God, and I'm righteous in all my ways. I'm righteous in all my judgments. He did show the human race that he could save it without denying himself. He showed all men that he does hate sin. He won't leave it unnoticed. And this, I mean, this had to happen in order for men to be saved. First came the penalty, and then comes the blessing, if I could say it that right. That's something that's declared in the message of the cross. Christ paid the penalty, and the result, you're blessed as a result of it. So let's not, by any means, neglect or forget what Jesus had to go through on our behalf, and also not forget the blessings that came with it.